Welcome, my dear university students and YouTube viewers, to Chapter 5's continuing coverage of thermochemistry. In this video, I will teach you heat capacity and specific heat. So, heat capacity is the amount of heat required to raise a substance's temperature by 1 degree Celsius or 1 Kelvin. Now, as it turns out, the size of a degree Celsius and the size of a Kelvin is exactly the same. So it doesn't matter which of these two you pick. The only difference is that they are 273.15 degrees apart from each other. But again, the magnitude or size of moving up a Kelvin is exactly the same as the magnitude or size of moving up a degree Celsius. OK, so it doesn't matter which of these you pick. Again, heat capacity is the amount of heat required to raise a substance's temperature by one of these. Now, just so you know, the higher the heat capacity, the more heat is required to change the substance's temperature. So a substance with a very high heat capacity requires a lot more heat to get its temperature to go up than a substance with a lower heat capacity. And by extension, a substance with a higher heat capacity also takes longer or slower amount of time to cool once it is heated. With that said, here's a cool lecture question. For each of the following pairs, I want you to choose the substance that is likely to have a higher heat capacity based on your own personal experience. Let's start with the first one, water or a cookie sheet? Well, from your own personal experience, boiling or heating water, you might have noticed that it takes a lot longer amount of time to get it warm than a cookie sheet. Now, a cookie sheet made of metal, and metals typically are this way, heats up and cools down very quickly, which is why we typically use metals for cooking. Now, because water takes more time to heat up and then afterwards to cool down, it's also another reason why we bathe in water. It stays warmer for longer than a bunch of molten metal, although molten metal would really, really harm us if we took a bath in it. Anyway, water must have a higher heat capacity. What about rebar versus a potato? Well, rebar is also made of metal. It's the metal that you put in the center of concrete when you're doing concrete forms or driveways. And as such, it requires less heat investment in order to heat up. In other words, metal heats up very fast. Potatoes, in contrast, take a lot more heat investment if you're comparing the same amount of potato to the same amount of rebar or metal in order to heat up. This is why in older times, before they had heated cars, people would sometimes heat potatoes and then hold the hot potato in their laps when they were riding in a horse-drawn carriage because the potato, once it was heated, would take a lot longer to cool so they could enjoy the heat for a while. Potato, made primarily of starch, has a much higher heat capacity than the metal in a rebar. This brings us then to specific heat. So the heat capacity of one mole of a substance is called its molar heat capacity or C sub M. In contrast, the heat capacity of one gram of a substance is called its specific heat capacity or just specific heat C sub S. I frankly wish that specific heat were called the granular heat capacity because it's essentially the same thing. C sub M is molar heat capacity C sub S is the granular heat capacity, but we don't use the term granular. We just call it specific heat. I don't know why. I think it would be less confusing if we called it granular heat capacity. Nevertheless, that's what specific heat is. The specific heat is defined by this equation. It's equal to the amount of heat transferred divided by the grams of the substance in question times the temperature change. For example, it takes 209 joules to increase the temperature of 50.0 grams of water by one Kelvin. Thus, water's specific heat or granular heat capacity is 209 joules divided by 50 grams times one Kelvin. If you throw that in your calculator rounded the correct number of significant figures, you come to this final answer of 4.18 joules per gram Kelvin. This means that if you have one gram of water and you want it to raise its temperature by one Kelvin or one degree Celsius, remember the size of a Kelvin and the size of a degree C is the same, you would have to invest 4.18 joules to do that. And again, I emphasize that the size of a degree Celsius and the size of a Kelvin is the same, though their absolute values are different. This means that when you're talking about a delta T or change in temperature, Kelvins and degree Celsius are interchangeable. Now, again, that is not true if you're just talking about the raw absolute temperature of a Kelvin versus a degree Celsius. But if you're talking about delta T, you can swap those out all you like. Now, based on a table taken from my recommended text for my students, Chemistry of Central Science, 12th edition, here are specific heat values for some substances at 25 degrees Celsius around room temperature. For various elements in their elemental formulas, their specific heats are here. And for various different common compounds, their specific heats are listed here. Let's end then with some cool problems taken from my university problem set. First, 
What is the specific heat of liquid water? What is the molar heat capacity of liquid water? What is the heat capacity of 185 grams of liquid water? And how many kJs of heat are needed to raise the temperature of 10 kilograms of liquid water from this temperature to that temperature? I invite you to pause the video, try this on your own first, and then hit play, upon which I will show you how to do it on the board. Question A asks for the specific heat of liquid water. For that question, you actually just have to look that up on a table. I don't require my university students to memorize that number, but that's the only way you're gonna solve it. You look it up on the table or on the internet or something and just write that answer in. It's this value right here. The units are joules per gram Kelvin, okay? Question B asks us to convert that into molar heat capacity. Now, what's the difference between specific heat and molar heat capacity, or heat capacity as it's often called? The only difference is units. Specific heat is joules per gram Kelvin. Molar heat capacity, or just heat capacity, is joules per mole Kelvin. That's it. So all I have to do is take this value and use some dimensional analysis slash unit conversion stuff in order to get, arrive at units of joules per mole Kelvin. That's it. And because we're specifically talking about water, we're going to use the fo formula weight or molecular weight of water in order to get there, there, OK? So I'm just going to go up here, and I want to replace essentially this grams here with moles. So I'm going to write down a set of parentheses here, and I'm going to write a certain number of grams in one mole of water. And for all of this, we're talking specifically about water, even though I'm not writing out the words of water here, OK? Now, how many grams are there in one mole of water? Yeah, each hydrogen weighs 1, each oxygen weighs 16. So there's two hydrogens in water. I'm not writing the formula down, apparently. Two hydrogens in water, they each weigh 1. And then I add 1 plus 1 plus 16 for the oxygen, it comes to 18. So there are 18 grams per mole, OK? The grams cancel each other out, and I'm left with my units of joules per mole times Kelvin, which is the molar heat capacity, often just called heat capacity. I'll let you do the multiplication on your own. Be sure to round to the correct number of significant figures when you're done. The next question asks us for the heat capacity of a specific amount of water, 185 grams. How do we do that? Well, remember what heat capacity means. It means that in order to raise one gram of water by one Kelvin, that is one degree, you have to invest 4.18 joules into it. So if I had one gram of water, which is a milliliter about, sitting there, and I wanted to raise this temperature by one Kelvin or one degree Celsius, I would have to pump in 4.18 joules. That's what that means, OK? So instead of that, though, what I have is 185 grams. How much heat would I have to throw in there to raise its temperature by a Kelvin? Well, to do that, I just take this value right here, 4.18 joules, and I've got grams times kelvins, as one of my past students calls it, uh, I guess, joules per geek, because <laughs> it kind of looks like the word geek down there. Anyway, the grams cancel each other out, and I'm left with total number of joules per kelvin, which means that if I wanted to raise it by one kelvin, whatever the answer comes out to be here, and I'll let you do the multiplication on your own, be sure to round to the correct number of sig figs here. That would be the amount of joules you'd have to invest for one Kelvin. Now, if you wanted to do it for two Kelvins, you would just double that. For three Kelvins, you would triple it, and so forth. So that is the answer to question C. Now, for question D, it asks, how many kilojoules would it take to raise the temperature of 10 kilograms of water by a specific uh, amount? I guess from 24.6 degrees Celsius to 46.2 degrees Celsius. So I've got a specific temperature range I'm trying to go 10 kilograms. Well, in order to do this, we just use our typical approach, dimensional analysis slash unit conversion, in order to cancel out the units we're given and arrive at our destination units, which in this case are kilojoules, right? So I'm going to go ahead and lay down a set of parentheses. Now, one thing you'll note is that all of the values I have up here that involve grams in some form do not involve kilograms. They involve grams. So I want to cancel out that kilograms and get to grams in order to aid me in that journey. So I'm going to lay down kilograms in the denominator and grams in the numerator. And that is possible because kilograms and grams are directly mathematically relatable. Okay? Now I want to eventually arrive at kilojoules. So let's lay down another set of parentheses. I want to put grams as my units here in the denominator because I want them to cancel out my grams in the numerator. Now, have I been given any values up here specific to liquid water that has units of grams in it? Yeah, I have. I've been given this specific heat up here that has grams times kelvins as its units in the denominator and joules in the numerator, specifically 4.18 joules being that many joules required to raise one gram of liquid water by one kelvin. Okay. Now, that is going to cancel out my grams and get me closer to kilojoules. I'm just at joules per kelvins. So how do I get rid of that kelvin? 
Well, it tells me a starting and an ending temperature, right, in degrees Celsius. The final temperature it tells me is 46.2, and the initial temperature is 24.6, okay? In order to figure out what the delta T is, the delta T, I have to have the temperature that's final, that's the temperature I end at, minus the temperature that's initial, right? So the temperature we're going to, or we end up at, minus the temperature we started at. What's the difference between those two? Yeah, it's 21.6, and again, that would be degrees Celsius. Now, as it turns out, and I've said this elsewhere, if you're talking about a delta T, that is a difference between two temperatures, degrees Celsius and Kelvins are completely interchangeable. In other words, if I change this 46.2 into Kelvins by adding 273.15 to it, and I did the same thing to the 24.6, add 273.15 to it, and then took the difference between those two, the difference would be identical. What I'm telling you is you'd get 21.6 Kelvins as well. So again, if you're dealing with a delta T, you can just interchange Kelvins and Celsius without doing any uh, additional math, okay? So we're trying to traverse 10.00 kilograms from this initial temperature, 24.6, up to 46.2. The delta T is 21.6 Kelvins. You see that? You'll notice that if I throw that in there, the Kelvins cancel each other out. Now I'm left to joules. Now the question did not ask for the answer in joules. It asked for it in kilojoules. So I can just lay down one more set of parentheses, place joules in the denominator and kilojoules in the numerator, and then I have to insert the numbers that I uh, have for each respective category, right? One kilojoule, because kilojoules big, contains a thousand joules, because joules are small. Okay, and that will, of course, arrive at my final destination units, because my joules here cancel out my joules there. I just focus on units, units, units. My kilograms here cancel out kilograms here. Oh, and I forgot to insert numbers here, by the way. Grams are small, so there are a thousand grams. Kilograms are big. Thousand grams in one kilogram. Conveniently, you'll notice that the thousands cancel each other out, too. So I just multiply all this stuff through, and I should end up with units in kilojoules. I'll let you do the multiplication on your own. Remember to round your final answer to the correct number of significant figures.